Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, in my hometown, out on the edge of the prairie. Spring has arrived finally, and the ice is mostly off the lake, and the first strawberries have arrived from California. You can get them on your pancakes, and that's the beginning. That's the beginning of spring, the snow melting down on the eaves and down onto the sidewalks. Beautiful, beautiful day. People laughing, just so happy this last week. Finally, the end to our suffering, our long, our long winter there on the frozen tundra. People laughing, happy, children being pushed on swings, going way up into the bare limbs of apple trees, up where they experience weightlessness, the very height of the ark, laughing out of terror and joy where religion begins, right there up at the, <laughs> the, the apex of the swing. Men laughing in the Chatterbox Cafe, drinking their coffee. Men who haven't laughed in a long time. Clint Bunsen, who got a birthday card. He laughed and laughed and laughed. It was a birthday card of a man sitting at the wheel and looking in the rearview mirror and seeing the grim reaper in the back seat with the, with the sigh and the big black hood over him and the little legend under that said objects may be closer than they appear. <laughs> Clint Bunsen, who felt so good, he went out driving in his car after church and just drove and drove and drove. And there he saw the real sign of spring, which is the first mosquito. It was there in his car. It was, it was, it was a mosquito that was just sort of mastering its own wings. And he knew he had an obligation, a moral obligation, to kill that mosquito. This mosquito would breed others who would breed others and others and others. This mosquito was the master of an enormous race of mosquitoes, of, of, of the, the George Washington of mosquitoes, the father of his country. So we breed terrific insects in Minnesota because winter kills off all of the weaker species. So the mosquitoes that are left are like birds. They're like hummingbirds. They're, they're, they're enormous, and b bug repellent only irritates them. They, you, you have to... You have to, a crucifix helps, but you have to, you have to hit them really hard. So he was driving along the county road and he was, he was swatting at this mosquito who was over there on the armrest on the passenger side, Clint Bunsen all by himself. And he almost got it and then he felt the right front wheel go down into the ditch, the ditch which is all mud and still snow at the bottom of it. And it kind of slewed down and he had to pull it back up. This would be amazing if you, if you ran into the ditch and you're four miles south of town after church on a Sunday. What were you doing out there? Where were you going? People would ask. He wasn't going any place. He was just driving around. But men his age, 60 years old, are not supposed to do that. That's something you do when you're 17. And you're lonely and you're moody and gloomy. You go out driving. But there he was. So it was a close call for him. Because people in our town do not have merciful imaginations. And when they imagine what a man 60 years old is doing four miles south of town on his way home from church, taking the long way round, they would imagine that he was going to the Moonlight Bay Supper Club to see Amber, the cocktail waitress. That's what <laughs> they would. Then he saw the mosquito in the back window of his car, and he pulled the car over, and he climbed over the front seat and he got into the back seat and he was swatting at it and now here came a car heading north towards town it was Mrs. Hoagland's car she looked away and the way she looked away you could tell it was because she saw him there and to see him there alone in the back seat <laughs> she had to assume that the other person had ducked down <laughs> So there, he'd brought disgrace on himself just by driving around freely. Mrs. Hoagland, our piano teacher 
and Lake Wobegon, famous for her silk dresses at piano recitals, always held in the spring about this time of the year. Her great silk dress and her and her great bosom like the prow of a ship and her and her glasses hanging from a chain around her neck, her glasses with precious jewels set into the frames. Mrs. Hoagland and her hair tied up with hairpins who raises children to believe that they can play Chopin and she has them play the same Chopin etude every spring in Pachelbel's Canon and, the, and, 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 and Going Home, the melody by Dvorak. She has them do it every year, every year. And always she weeps when she hears the Going Home by Dvorak, although it's not usually played well enough to be wept at. <laughs> many people went for lessons, but not many were chosen by God. God did not put his hand on many people from Lake Wobegon and give them raw talent. Even if you practice, 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 and play your scales over and over, you come to your recital to play Chopin, and you're there to do the high jump, but instead of going over the bar, you just run under it. <laughs> Nonetheless, Mrs. Hoagland would weep when you took your run at Chopin's etude in the Pachelbel Canon and Dvorak's going home. Clint Bunsen weeps to think of his daughter Kira who played going home by Dvorak because it was played at his sister Clarissa's wedding at which so many people wept because they knew this was not going to work out. <laughs> Somehow you just know. Where did she meet Bradley? She met him at a book club. They were, they were reading some book. The Permanence of Hope was the title of it. And it gave them ideas. He was a good man in the worst sense of the word. He was a man who always wore a white shirt with a pocket protector. He was in the heating and air conditioning business. Precision was his business and reliability. He had no sense of humor whatsoever. The man was a cliche with legs. <laughs> the bottom line, that was his phrase, at the end of the day, the bottom line. That's what's important. It is what it is, he used to say. It is what it is. We are who we are. I am. That's just who I am, he would say. He was a literalist, had no imagination whatsoever. Clarissa was 41 years old. It had been a long wait for her. She met him at the book club, and they went to a movie, and I guess he put his arm around her, and she felt obligated to marry him somehow. <laughs> Her mother thought they would make a nice couple, and so she, to please her mother, she, she, she went down the aisle, down the aisle with tears in her eyes. All of those gifts, all of those stainless steel gifts and the, and the crystal serving dishes, enough to open a tea room and towels and so on, none of them monogrammed because people knew this would not work out. <laughs> You just knew this was not going to work out. There were six bridesmaids. They wore yellow dresses, dresses that had been left over from Clarissa's cousin's wedding, Eleanor's wedding, who got as far as her rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner, and the rehearsal convinced Eleanor that marriage was not for her. And without saying a word to anybody, she got in her car and she drove to New York City. She said she was going for cigarettes, <laughs> which I guess they sell in New York. And so here she was, and she just left them all behind. She gave them a call from Pennsylvania. She said she was all right. They fussed at her, but she was gone. What could she, they do? So these yellow dresses stayed in the closet for a long time. Clarissa inherited her wedding gown as well. She had to lose 30 pounds to fit into her cousin's wedding gown. It was just all hand-me-down. The bridesmaids for the Carissa's wedding were chosen by their size. <laughs> Three of them she barely knew. But it was a nice wedding, except that people knew this was not going to work out. He's old now. He's living in Des Moines, old, sad man living in a room all by himself. They were married for about four years, and then 
came the divorce. The pornography did not help. It just, <laughs> that was not good. And then the drinking. It's just who I am, he said. So, so she called in the executioner and, uh, and pulled the cord and the guillotine fell. And now she's living by herself in Minneapolis teaching English as a second language. It's not bad. But Clint weeps to think of his sister, his good sister, who came from the deliberative side of the family. Eleanor was from the impulsive side. Clarissa went to visit Eleanor in New York a few years ago and discovered the art of stating personal preference, that it can be done. You can say, I want this. I don't want that. You can. In Lake Wobegon, you have to say, I'd love to, but I can't. And then invent a story. In New York, you could say, frankly, I don't want to. And after a while, you can leave off the frankly. Don't want to do it. Just don't. This is what Clint tried to tell his sister. Back in the anteroom, she felt nauseous. She had to put her head down between her knees. This was back when bouffant hairdos were in. So a woman would walk into the beauty shop, and she'd walk out eight inches taller. <laughs> this great mound of hair, this big helmet on top of you. A, a brick could fall on you, and it wouldn't hurt you. This great beehive hairdo she put down between her knees, and she was weeping, and he knelt down by her. Dad was dead, so Clint was going to give his sister away, whatever that means. He said, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do it. And he could hear his cousin inside playing the Dvorak going home. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do what you don't want to do. In the winter you do, but not in the spring. It's free now in the spring. You don't have to do it if you don't want to do it. You don't have to. You can turn around and walk away from it. Why? Because we live in a paradise. This is a paradise. Life itself is good enough. You walk outside on a spring morning out into your uncle's farmyard and you look around. This life, it's all we need. Just this life, this earth. Morning light, soft and bright, will be gone reveals Early frost all across farm and woods and fields. Coffee done, I'll have some. Step outside alone. Look around, set me down on a slab of stone. By the barn, cattle turn, murmur in the pen. Strong and pure, cow manure, I know where I am, I am home again, I am home again. Precious Lord, by your word, simple gifts are blessed. Creatures all great and small, heavenly love express, love and faithfulness. Let the promise of salvation come by daily observation in this farmyard, Lord. My old dog takes his walk, sniffing every tree. Every smell seems to tell his biography. Chickens dash across the grass, cats patrol the yard. Seven geese marching east form an honor guard. Then a small trumpet call ringing to 
the skies. Three loud barks. Woof, woof, woof. Wake up and arise. Be in paradise. Be in paradise. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average.